the um, the cognitive implications. I mean, yeah. Th this is this 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 seems to have enabled a kind of a, a greater distance of meta reflectivity of uh, uh, an explosion in vocabulary differentiation, which which expanded the dimensionality of our minds, our ability to think about our thinking and so forth. Can you speak to well, that's the right. Cognitive. Well, it has enormous metacognitive uh, implications. Um, uh, the power is this, that you can not only think in ways that you could not possibly think if you did not have the written word, but you can now think about the thinking that you do with the written word. And there is a danger in this, and the danger is that the enormous expressive and self-referential capacities of the written word, that is the capacities to keep referring to referring to referring, will reach a point where you lose contact with the real world. And this, believe me, is very common in universities. Uh, there's a technical name for it. I don't know if we can use it on television. It's called bullshit. Uh, but the, but the, this is very common in academic life, where people just get a form of self-referentiality of the language, where the language is talking about the language which is talking about the language, and in the end it's hot air. That's another name for the same phenomenon. So here's the trick. The trick is to use the expressive power of language, but keep your feet on the ground. Always know what you're talking about. And of course, much of what you're talking about is linguistically created reality. Money and government and, and uh, private property. George Bush is president only because we represent him as being president. If we stop thinking of his president, then he can't function as a president. He is president, and this is no joke, because of words. <laughs> he's president because we have the capacity to think he's president, and we have that capacity to think because we can represent his being president in the form of words. So I'm not saying that, that there isn't a reality created by language. There is. But you have to keep your eye on the reality, whether it's the brute reality of, of mountains and molecules and tectonic plates, or it's the institutional reality of presidencies and governments and universities and, and uh, private property. Uh, and all of those require the written word. Aren't they distinct in the sense that up until this point, even with the first beginnings of oral language before writing, there's this immediate sensorial contact with one another, with the with the world yeah. we're contacting, even with the sound and movement yeah. of words back and forth. But when we talk to, we start talking about writing and all that it makes possible, we're crossing the line into virtual reality, into artificial yeah. Well, reality. now you can do something else with writing uh, that you can't do until you get writing, and that is you can have very elaborate forms of fiction. See, uh, pre-literate societies can also have myths and can, uh, can have stories that are told and passed down through the generations. But I don't think that they can have the elaborate fictional art forms that we have. No pre-literate society has something corresponding to the novel. For example, I, you, you can have uh, uh, stories, but my guess is, and this is only a guess on my part, is you can't make a clear distinction between the fictional story where the author is not committed and the non-fictional story where you're just uh, uh, telling a narrative of how things happen. You don't get a clear uh, demarcation of those two until you get some capacity to represent it in writing. See, I think when the Greeks, um, uh, they're of course a very literate society, but I think in the early days uh, of Homer, when they were uh, uh, telling uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, when it was coming in oral forms, I don't think they made a clear distinction between how much of this is supposed to be fictional and how much of it's supposed to be fact. They, it was just part of their oral tradition. Right, right. And then within a few hundred years of getting the alphabet... Well, it takes off. takes off like crazy, yeah. Can you speak to that one moment in yeah. Western civilization? It seems like there's two, when the, the Jews uh, start writing the book yeah. and the Greeks start using... The same thing. They're both using very. They're both using language, that. right? Boom. Yeah. Here's Christ speaking Aramaic, and who knows what happened when it got into Greek? And I'm where I mean, I'm not enough of a scholar to know about this, but um, uh, one hypothesis is that the Greek word for virgin is the same for uh, for young girl, and that this was a mistranslation of the uh, 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 of what what had been in Hebrew and Aramaic. I mean, that's the kind of thing that happens when the when the Greeks take over. <laughs> Okay. Um, back to cognitive functions for yeah. just a moment. We are talking about a different, uh, an exercise in the 
uh, bandwidth, so to speak, a change in our attention span. I mean, one yeah. of the things about reading is we're buffering, it requires a lot. Up. Yeah, our, our brains are doing something different. They're it's they're scary. Creating yeah. a code in, instructed and informed virtual reality. The point is, we're now in a kind of torrent. We're now in a flood, a tidal wave of the printed word. I cannot even read all the intelligent attacks on myself. Uh, and I look around this room, uh, there must be at least 200 or more books in this room that I've never read, and I'm unlikely to be able to have time to read them. And there's something else that happens in, in my line of business, and that is when I was a kid, I couldn't afford to buy the books I need. Now, I can't shelve the books that are mailed to me free. They keep coming in every day. And, I, and so there is too damn much out there, and I don't know how we're gonna cope with this. We reached a peculiar situation in academic life where the, the requirement that you publish has produced a lot more books than anybody ever needs to read. And it's now putting a tremendous drain on the publishers because they can't make a, a living out of publishing all of these books. So I don't know what's going to happen, but we've reached a kind of crisis in academic writing and academic publishing. There's too much of it. Well, relatively, just a, a quick aside. The, you're you're seeing the perspective of the literate, the yeah, literate, that's the, right. the highest vantage that's of right. literacy. But there's a hundred million people in this country that are underwater. That's right. For whom the code is not transparent like yeah. it is for you and I. And one of the things that we're trying to draw out that you might be interested in is is that this combination of assembling this virtual reality experience yeah. from this code, which has a very sloppy mismatch with yeah. the sound systems that we learn as little kids, is creating a form of confusion. That, as far as we can tell, the brain of human beings never experienced before. Yeah. Right? Well, what, an artificial yeah. form of confusion that children are developing a pre conscious shame aversion to want yeah. to go near. Yeah. Well, there is this peculiar situation, and I don't fully understand it, and that is the conflict between the print media and the visual media. I, and I think a lot of my students were brought up on television, and it takes an enormous effort, which it did not take for me, for example, in high school, to get attuned to the fact of reading big books uh, that have uh, hard covers and have more than a couple of hundred pages. And uh, it's not over in an hour, and there are no commercial breaks. Uh, and it takes a kind of discipline and attention. And maybe in the end, that's what universities function to do, is to teach people how to read. Uh, because an awful lot of my students I, I give me the impression that they arrive in the university without much real experience of reading, but they are attuned to all of the visual references. They know the names of movie stars and TV stars that I never heard of, and they keep referring to television programs that I never heard of, and it was this was obviously part of their culture. That was not part of my culture. I, that we went to Hollywood movies when I was a kid, but once a week at most, and the television was too ridiculous to be worth watching. If you were, if you were an intellectual, and I think it's probably still uh, uh, too ridiculous. But something else has happened, and this is uh, related to the print medium. Is we we're seeing now a breakdown of the distinction between high culture and popular culture. Now, university humanities departments exist for the purpose of celebrating and transmitting high culture. That's one of their main functions. So if they lose that distinction, then it's hard to know exactly how why we're paying them, I mean, what they're supposed to be doing. It could be a boon for the university budget elsewhere. Well, it might be. If we phase out uh, the, the more pretentious and stupid uh, humanities departments, but still, that's hard to do.